to suggest that blue zones are plant-based diets is absolutely patently false. I mean, Icaria in Greece is well known for eating all sorts of meat. Let's face it, everybody wants youthful skin and longevity. And uh, when we look at everything from supplements to stem cell therapy, we're still trying to crack the code on all of this. But what if you could do one thing or make one change to achieve youthful looking skin, you can improve longevity and maybe even shed a few pounds at the same time. Uh, with our special guest today, we're gonna explore one possible theory that it, we really, you can achieve this and it's, it involves eating loads of meat. Um, he's Dr. Paul Saladino, AKA Carnivore MD, an author of The Carnivore Code. Um, Dr. Saladino is a passionate proponent of the carnivore diet, and I really appreciate you being on here today. I'm so excited for us to learn from you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of nuance here. Yeah, definitely. And so, you know, the interesting part is that, uh, you know, for the general public, we hear about so many different diets. Uh, you know, from the raw vegetable diet, the Atkins to all meat, we, uh, you know, the big trend for everybody to move to vegan. Um, why don't we do this? To start off, listen, tell me about your journey. How'd you get here? Um, it, you know, what were you trying to change? What, 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 what sparked this interest? You know, I was in residency at the University of Washington and I had skin issues, so I had eczema. And I had eczema and asthma pretty much my whole life. So I had atopic conditions my whole life. Mm -hmm. I had eczema on my hands, on my elbows. And it was pretty bad. And so I had this flare in residency. I was doing a bunch of mushroom extracts like chaga and reishi. Mm -hmm. And I had the worst flare of eczema that I've ever had. And I thought, this is crazy. I, I feel like I'm eating a healthy diet. It's mostly grass-fed meat, salads, nuts, fruit, a, a mix of things pretty paleo, if people are familiar with that term. And I just thought, I need to simplify this. And I think elimination diets are very powerful for autoimmune skin conditions, autoimmune conditions in general. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of germane to this conversation today. So I got rid of everything except meat. Now it's kind of a long journey. If people have followed my arc, you know that I don't just eat meat now, but for about a year and a half, I only ate meat and organs, the stuff that nobody wants to think about eating. Like <laughs> And the good side of that was that my skin condition, conditions got better. So like my eczema resolved. And now I've seen this over and over in tons of people that when they change their diet and they get rid of certain things, and we can talk about what things I think might be most offensive, their acne or their eczema or their psoriasis gets better. I see this all the time. Like I'll be, I was in the airport in San Jose, in Costa Rica, and like multiple people have stopped me on my recent trip to the United States and said, hey, I have plaque psoriasis, which was pretty severe. They got better when, I, when they changed the diet. Fast forward, after about a year and a half, I added back some carbohydrates, and we can talk about that if you want. I feel like sure. carbohydrates are pretty critical for the human organism based on our biochemistry. Sure. I think there are better and worse sources of carbohydrates for humans. Mostly I focus on fruit and honey, simple carbohydrates, even though those get a bad rap sometimes. Mm -hmm. Lots of deep rabbit holes to go down. So though I think meat and organs are critical components of the human diet, I don't just eat meat and organs. Kind of tried to let people know, like, hey, I'm eating something that I would term an animal based diet in stark contradistinction to a plant based diet, right? Sure. So I eat animal based, which is meat and organs, which I think are the center of any human diet, and then carbohydrates from fruit, honey. I also do raw dairy. So we can talk about any and all of that, but that's kind of my journey. Yeah. But the skin stuff is super interesting to me. I almost went into dermatology. I probably should have. <laughs> well, I know. Listen, it is very interesting because, um, you know, as a plastic surgeon, I can easily tell when someone is overindulging on a certain portion of the diet, you know, when you've got complex starches, sugars, uh, you know, a lot of processed foods, and, and all the things that you kind of talk about. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, it's so interesting because usually when people talk about a meat diet, you know, or a meat-based diet, um, the first thing the, the naysayers or poo-pooers say is, well, it's very inflammatory. And so the idea is it's inflammatory. It's going to cause all of these issues. Uh, you know, what, what's your response to that? I mean, there's so many good studies. I just posted about this on Twitter yesterday. Like, mm. you know, there was a study, I forget what year, maybe 2016, where they reduced 200 grams of 
carbohydrates in people's diets, mostly grain-based carbohydrates, and they had them actually reduce carbohydrates and they had them eat 200 grams of red meat. And inflammatory markers went down. So like, I think there was a trend toward HSCRP, F2X prostate went down. So I've never seen, and this is not hyperbole, a single interventional trial in humans suggesting that red meat causes inflammation. I don't know where people are getting this idea. It's sure. just, there's so many of these notions in the popular sort of zeitgeist of nutrition and health that are just parroted by the mainstream media, which clearly has an agenda, um, which is more plant-based. And that's kind of why I do the work I do. Like, well, no, hey, there's not a lot of literature to support this. And there's literature on, on the other side. You know, yeah, yeah. Just that, hey, replacing grain-based carbohydrates with meat lowers inflammation. How can you say meat is inflammatory? Yeah. Like hand weaving voodoo, in my opinion. I don't see anything to support that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, my business partner and I are involved in setting up a regenerative medicine center, a wellness center. Um, and the idea is we're, we look at some of these companies like the Babraham Institute in London, or we look at, you know, a, a lot of the research oriented centers here. And they talk about blue zones and blue zones where they look at their diets and you know for those of you who don't know blue zones are you know, where they have plenty of centigenarians or people who live past 100 and are relatively healthy and they are looking at them saying that they have mainly a plant-based diet um you know what credence do you hold to that or what's you know i hear all these stories someone told me the other day it was a some war between russia and ukraine and uh, they ended up removing meat from the soldiers and they all ended up being healthy or something like that. They told me this story and I thought, gosh, it's so interesting because there is nothing really to back it up, but we have these nebulous things out there and you're right, the media just blasts it forward. And so, you know, when we talk about blue zones, what's, what's your take on that? It's an incredible marketing campaign. I mean, the history is that Dan Buettner and a couple other researchers from National Geographic picked five zones of the world, Sardinia, Ikaria, Okinawa, Loma Linda, and the fifth one is the Nicoya region of Costa Rica, which is actually pretty close to where I am now. I've lived in the Nicoya region of Costa Rica. And they went to these places and they created this idea of like blue zones. And these people in these zones, they all have like family, they have good community, they have meaning in their lives, they all live pretty simple lives, and they don't eat a lot of processed food. And the other thing is like four out of the five eat a lot of meat, but Dan Buettner won't tell you this. I've seen it on the podcast. He like admitted it. And he just, he kind of like, they kind of like suppress it. They don't want people to know that. They, I think that there are some similarities in these zones of longevity that have to do with community and meaning in your life and not being overly frenetic in the pace of your life. But to suggest that blue zones are plant-based diets is absolutely patently false. I mean, Icaria in Greece, is well known for eating all sorts of meat. I mean, if you just look at their traditional diets, like traditional goat and lamb, there's a traditional dish in Sardinia called Sarda pig. And it's these pigs that are farmed in the highlands and, and the people there relish them. And so I've known many people that have been to Icaria. And what, are the, what is the first thing they eat? eat like goat on a rotisserie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okinawans love their pork. You know, much more than the rest of Japan. And there's a great study by, might have been like the, the government of Japan or something from the 1980s that I've talked about in the past. And it looks at this the longevity of the Okinawans compared to the sort of the mainland Japanese people. And when they went to Okinawa, this is really an important point that can't be overemphasized. There were zero centenarians among vegetarians and vegans. They did not find centenarians among, so like, where is that in the Blue Zones conversation? There are no centenarians who are vegan and vegetarian in Okinawa. So, again, this is one of these things which is unfortunately just kind of fake. It's, it's just all puff pieces. Sure. And then the one place that's quote-unquote a Blue Zone, which is Loma Linda, California, where they donate a lot of meat, they actually donate a lot of meat there because it's a Seventh-day Adventist community, and for religious reasons, they avoid meat. So that's interesting, but you can look at other regions of California or other groups in California, like California Mormons, who do eat meat, but have similar sort of religious um, enthusiasm fervor that allows them to avoid alcohol and tobacco. And they live just as long as the people in Loma Linda. Sure. So there are all of these sort of ideas that get lost in the, in, in the fray. And people want to say it's a plant-based diet, which is just, that's really just false. It's, it's probably community, Avoidance of alcohol and tobacco, finding meaning in your life is very good for your longevity. And mm -hmm. I would argue, similarly, 
generally that if you want to live a long time, the thing that kills people is frailty. We know that sarcopenia, the loss of lean muscle mass as we age, is a huge risk factor for frailty. How many people listening to this have had a loved one fall and break their hip and then go to the hospital, and that's where they usually die? Yeah, the slow decline. So if you want to maintain lean muscle mass, you must eat protein. And I think there's clear evidence that animal protein, which is not inflammatory, remember, is much more bioavailable and a much better way to maintain lean muscle mass than any sort of plant protein, which has all sorts of problems with it. Contaminants, because it has to be processed, it's not very bioavailable. It comes with anti-nutrients, it comes with all sorts of things that can damage our gut. So basically, if you want to live a long time, be in a place where you have a good community, do things that make you feel joy and that are meaningful, and get some good sleep, maybe get in the sun and do things that are playful, and eat some freaking meat. Yep. This is crazy. Yeah. It's, it's, it makes me a little frustrated. that There's a lot of misinformation out there. That word is so loaded. Um, there's a lot of misleading information out there, and I think that that's why it's good to share with people that there are other ideas, and help people become curious to research it themselves. Sure. Um, shift a little, or I should say focus a little more on the, you know, when we talk about the benefits of this diet on skin itself, obviously it's very important in my field. Um, I, you know, I can perform a facelift, but if I don't do something to rejuvenate the skin, it's the difference between a B plus result and an A plus result. What are we looking at in terms of nutrients? You know, obviously heavy in iron, uh, but what else in meat do you think really contributes to improvement in skin? Collagen is a huge one, right? People are now supplementing collagen like crazy, but yeah. the hydrolyzed collagen is just not nearly as bioavailable as skin collagen. It's in meat. Like, sure. What do you think is all the connective tissue in meat? It's collagen. It's a three amino acid peptide that contains you know, glycine, which is kind of rare in the human diet if we're not getting collagen. If you want the most bioavailable collagen, it's bone broths, probably that, that you are making yourself rather than a store-bought bone broth, which is likely to be pretty pretty weak bone broth. Or it's it's like kind of fibrous meats. Like I love skirt steak. It has all that tendon tissue in it. Like that's how you get collagen. And so that, that's, people know about collagen, but collagen and meat is kind of a no-brainer. That's the first step. And then you have all the nutrients that are important for skin health. And it's it, the list is long. I mean, people have heard about biotin. Well, where do you get biotin in your diet? Mm. You can take a supplement, but... Doesn't, if, you, if, if these are important for skin health, we can kind of reverse engineer and be like, oh, maybe these are foods we should be eating for other reasons too. It all makes sense kind of from an evolutionary perspective, right? Yep. Well, biotin is an organ. The best source of biotin is liver. And almost no one is going to eat liver, but if you want to eat liver, you can get some fresh liver, some frozen liver. I talk about this all the time. Or you can use things like desiccated organs like we make at Hardened Soil. It's a company that I built to help people get these nutrients if they don't want to eat the organs. Um, but that's just the beginning. Then you, you mentioned iron. There's so many of these critical nutrients, even peptides can help with the skin, in the skin or in other things. I don't know if you're familiar with trachea and scapula cartilage. This was new to me when I started learning about these specific organs. There's a surgeon named John Pruden. He's deceased now, but he did a lot of research wound healing, looking at specific peptides in trachea and scapula cartilage. Now, it's basically not very easy for anyone to get trachea and scapula cartilage. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, it's in, it's in the desiccated organs that we make. It's in one of our skin, hair, and nails formulas. And it's like, there are unique peptides here that, that help the skin. So that, the, basically, if you want to support your skin in terms of nutrients, getting meat and organs and animal foods, don't fear them for all the reasons we talked about, is, is one side. But I think we should also talk about the things you want to avoid, which can harm your skin, because that's really interesting as well. Sure. Some of the basics. You know, I had alluded to it a little earlier on looking at some of my patients and I can tell, you know, what they're overindulging in, but let's say top three avoid for skin health. So there's things that you can eat that are harm your skin and there's things you can put on your skin that will uh, harm your skin. Let's talk about the things you put on your skin that can harm your skin. So this is very fascinating. So, okay, let's talk about one thing you can put on your skin that's helpful for your skin is cholesterol. So nobody ever puts cholesterol on their skin, but I think we should make, and I'm working with a company, like I have a company, we're going to make a moisturizer that has cholesterol. There's clear evidence. I think it's a 2011, 2012 study in um, the Journal of Dermatologic Science. I was just looking at it for this podcast. When they put a cholesterol-containing moisturizer on the skin, it decreases inflammation. And when they put linoleic acid on the skin, which is this omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid found in seed oils, it causes inflammation in the skin. So if you had to pick, like the number one thing you don't want to put on your skin is linoleic acid. And if you look, 
And it, what is in moisturizers and stuff? It's in so many. Almost always going to be oils that are high in linoleic acid. This is quite confusing for people. So if you look at your moisturizer, you don't want it to have anything like sunflower oil, safflower oil, but you have to look because like shea butter is low in linoleic acid, but argon, jojoba, a lot of these oils that end up like raspberry seed oil in these moisturizers are very high in linoleic acid. So you don't want to put linoleic acid on your skin. A lot of sunscreens are also built around linoleic acid containing oils. So that's a huge thing you don't want to put on your skin is linoleic acid. I also have major concerns about a lot of mainstream sunscreens because they contain things like oxybenzone and avabenzone, which we know are absorbed through the skin and then are excreted in the poop and the pee, and those are connected to cancer. But that's why these are banned in Europe and, uh, exactly. you know, there are other countries. Yeah, so we just haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, we're, we're always behind that. <laughs> like to say the pesticide is much more regulated in Europe than it is here. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the skin, um, you know, your audience may not know this, but I'm sure that you know that like anything less than 500 grams per mole, so like a molecular weight of less than 500 grams per mole can get through the skin. The linoleic acid is 250 grams per mole. So like it's, you can easily get you know, linoleic acid through the skin and, and it'll be absorbed into the skin cell membranes. And so if you're putting linoleic acid on your skin, all of these cell membranes of your skin, the dermis everywhere, your face, that are facing the sun are full of this fragile polyunsaturated fatty acid that's just getting oxidized. Yeah. Listen, I always say the same thing, and sorry to, to, to interrupt you, but um, when we look at even a good moisturizer, a good moisturizer obviously will have some ingredients that are not hot, you know, the, a lot of silicone-based products as well, but again, linoleic acid, the ones that sit on the skin, uh, 10 minutes later, you shouldn't feel it. That's a good moisturizer, whereas most moisturizers just sit on the skin and the thought is that it traps in moisturizer, but it doesn't really do that. So I agree with you 100%. You know, the best moisturizer that I've found is tallow, and this is a total hack for your for your listeners like it's beef fat and i i love it and it's like trending now on social media we're yeah. pumping this i'm going to build some moisturizers with one of my companies that are based on tallow and sunscreens that are based on tallow but if people go to the store go to aralon go wherever you want to go buy tallow and put it on your skin you'll be amazed at how good it feels it doesn't make it doesn't make acne it's non comedogenic mm -hmm. but it, it actually is so good for your skin it's, it's beef fat why is it good for your skin? Because it's very low linoleic acid. It has vitamin E naturally occurring in the tallow. So like basically putting beef fat on your skin is one of the best things you can do for your skin. And guess what? Eating beef fat is how you get those fatty acids to your skin from the inside out. And then similarly, eating linoleic, linoleic acid, the seed oil, is a bad way. That's going to put it in your skin from the inside out. So you don't want to eat seed oils and you don't want to put them on your skin either. So there's so many things like that that will, that will irritate your skin. So other things you can eat that will irritate your skin are sorolin containing foods. So sorolin is P-S-O-R-A-L-E-N. Um, things like celery. So there's really interesting, there's actually case reports of phototoxic injury from celery juice cleanses. So I don't know why, I guess, I guess people want to be young and somehow vegetables seem like, or fruit, you know, vegetable juices, I'm a fan of fruit juice, but of course. vegetable juices seem like they're pure and they're just, they're going to make you light and airy. Your skin's going to be so glowing. But there's case reports of people who are doing celery juice cleanses. Celery is very high in sorolins. And they go to a tanning bed and they get phototoxic, they get like massive injury because sure. the sorolins accumulate in the dermis. They can cross link with the DNA and become susceptible to phototoxic injury. So the whole family of parsnips, like the whole family of carrots, parsnips, turnips, uh, celery, these all contain significant amounts of sorolins and furanocumarins. Citrus has it, but it's mostly grapefruit that has the, the furanocumarins and the sorolins. So grapefruit, maybe not a great thing for the skin or maybe not overconsumed. And there's actually some pretty compelling data. It's at least enough to make people curious that citrus, especially grapefruit consumption, is associated with higher rates of melanoma. Wow. So, yeah, and so, and interestingly, so is fish oil consumption. So fish oil is an omega-3. This is a highly polyunsaturated fatty acid that is associated with increased melanoma. And polyunsaturated fatty acids like linoleic acid in the nurse's health study are also associated with increased rates of every skin cancer, melanoma, squamous, and basal. So like eating these things, you just don't want fragile oils in your skin. 
But then again, what's the option? You have to eat animal fats, which are high in saturated fat. That's what we want. What we've been told they're bad for us. It's, it's like upside down. Right? Yeah, it's completely uh, counterintuitive to what we've been taught. And the, you know, speaking of fats, I mean, looking at the carnivore diet, we'll say um, when we look at weight loss, Dr. Saldino is shredded. I mean, this guy, I, I can't imagine you got more than 3% body fat. But explain why this seems to work. Because for us, when we say it, you know, when we look at uh, fats, especially that can be in the marbling of meats and, and things like that, even high quality meats, uh, it's counterintuitive to what we have grown up with, what we've been taught. We want, you know, all the, we want the low fat diet, all these different things. Why does it work? I'm probably 12 or maybe I'm nine or 10% body fat. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally <laughs> on podcast which is called Fundamental Health, I share my labs. My testosterone is like 800. I don't take anything for it. Mm -hmm. so my, uh, and I'm 45, for people that are interested. Mm -hmm. um, like my, my body fat is higher than three. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I've done some videos and podcasts on weight loss. Again, it's like the whole paradigm is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. We think that we need to restrict calories for weight loss. But if you restrict calories, you get stuck in this sort of race to the bottom because your thyroid gland in your neck sort of senses that you're starving and it'll tone down your metabolism. So calories in, calories out kind of works. There is such thing as conservation of energy and thermodynamics, but the quality of the calories you put in your body affects how many calories you burn on the back end. So the calories in affects the calories out. Now that's the tricky part, that if you starve yourself, you're gonna burn less calories. So what I recommend to people is that they improve their food quality. And how do you improve your food quality? You get rid of all the processed foods. And we know this, but processed foods creep in people's diets. And so that's why I'm a huge advocate for an animal-based diet, which focuses on meat and organs, but also has fruit, honey, fruit juice, raw dairy, simple foods that are not processed. And what does it eliminate? It eliminates seed oils, it eliminates binders, it eliminates carrageenan and gums, which are going to damage the gut, and it eliminates a lot of vegetables. Now, vegetables is a very controversial thing. I think some people can eat vegetables and not have major problems. But if people are out there and they're struggling with things like acne or autoimmune conditions, I think doing an elimination diet like an animal-based diet that eliminates vegetables is very powerful. I was at the farmer's market here in Costa Rica the other day, and this woman came up to this beautiful woman, and she said, doing an animal-based diet helped me so much with my acne. And I've heard this over and over and over. Like, it's sometimes like spinach or kale or grains or oats that we think are healthy can trigger inflammation in the skin and the acne because they're damaging the gut in some ways. Yeah. So, like these vegetables, they're the parts of plants that plants don't want us to eat. They're full of defense chemicals. And this is something very few people have ever talked about. We think they're great for us, but they're really just sort of like survival food. You know, and you think about it, if you're in the wilderness, most of your audience isn't living in the wilderness. Yeah. <laughs> and if they are, then you yeah. know, God bless them. We'll signal to you. Yeah. But like, if you're in the wilderness, like you're not gonna eat bitter leaves and like nuts that are hard to process and you have to cook the heck out of them or seeds. You're gonna eat meat when you can kill an animal, and you're gonna hopefully do that. You're gonna eat honey when you get a hold of it. You're gonna eat fresh, you know, like ripe fruit. And if you happen to have figured out animal husbandry, you're gonna milk a cow or a goat and do that. That's about what you're going to do. And if you're starving, you might eat some leaves, but it's not the first choice for any human throughout our history. Anyone who's been to like any of the hunter-gatherer tribes will understand that. You know, I just wanted to uh, focus in. You had alluded to raw dairy and, and things like that. So here, you know, especially in, in California, which I find funny because it's the number one dairy state outside of where I'm from, Wisconsin. Um, but the idea is that dairy is bad for you and, uh, you know, causes all of the potential, you know, I'm trying to think of the last allergist that, you know, my wife went to that said, eliminate dairy and you will lose all of your uh, allergies. And it's interesting that what you are saying is essentially the opposite. You're telling us raw dairy is good for you. Expound. There's a couple of studies, they're epidemiology, but they're really compelling. And there's multiple studies. One of them is called the Gabriella study. I forget the name of the other one. I can send it to you. So they, they clearly show, even probably from the last 10 years, that kids who grow up eating raw dairy on or off a farm, so even kids in the cities that grow up eating raw dairy, have lower rates of asthma, exer, uh, allergy, and hay fever when they're adults. So this really flies in the face of the notion that dairy itself is causing allergy. And when you dig into this, which is really fascinating for me, what you find is that on the surface, you think maybe it's, it has to do with like the gut flora or 
these raw dairies have like different micro, you know, biota that affect our gut flora, but it doesn't seem to be that. It's something about the heating of the milk changes the conformation of the whey protein. Mm -hmm. So people have heard of whey and casein. People might actually take whey protein. Well, proteins are sensitive to heat. And we know this because when we cook eggs, you have a clear white, and then you heat it, and the white becomes opaque and white because you're changing the conformation of the white when you heat it. Well, the same thing can happen to the proteins in the milk when you heat them. And the key point for whey protein appears to be about 165 degrees Fahrenheit. And so any milk that's pasteurized has been exposed to temperatures that are greater than 165. And it appears to lose the protective effect of the whey protein when that happens. So I think that if milk is immunogenic for people, it's probably due to this changing of the conformation of the whey protein and the loss of the protection that we see in kids. So like multiple studies, like I said, with kids show this strong, significant correlation between raw milk and dairy and lower rates of asthma and eczema. Now, in California, you're very fortunate because you can get raw milk there. It's not illegal. I go to Erewhon, they have raw milk from multiple farms, raw goat's milk. They have great stuff. You can get raw kefir there. And if people are listening and they're not in California, you can use a website called rawmilk.com or realmilk.com. And it'll show you where to get raw milk in different states. In some states, it's illegal, and you have to go like under the radar to get it. But even in states where milk is illegal, you can find cheeses that are made with raw dairy. And the easiest of these would be like the traditional Parmigiano Reggiano from Italy. The Italians take their cheese very seriously mm -hmm. as around the cheese. And to be called a Parmigiano Reggiano, it has to be from grass-fed cows, and it has to be a raw milk. So that's and you know it's going to have like an actual animal rennet to make the cheese as opposed to a vegetable, vegetable rennet, which ends up in some cheeses and can create autoimmune issues for people. So it's so the dairy, I think, is valuable for people. Just the quality of the dairy matters and the quality of the meat matters. And so I've heard from so many people that they have such a better reaction to raw dairy. Here in Costa Rica, I get raw goat's milk. Women stop me at the different women stop me at the farmer's market. I have a good track record of women stopping me at the farmer's market and talking to me. And this woman said, uh, oh, this... Um, this, uh, this raw milk is much better for me than, um, than the pasteurized milk. And so it's much easier for her to digest it. And Interesting. In terms of milk, some people have lactose intolerance. And if that's the case, you can just use a fermented form of milk, like a kefir. Some people say kefir, but I think it's kefir. Yeah. Or you can use a cheese. Okay. What would you recommend as far as for someone who, let's say they can't do a cold turkey. They're slowly moving in. What are the top... Well, what would you say? They go to the grocery store and we're going to look for three things to start building your diet around. What are they going to be? Are you jumping right to liver? Or are you going to say, all right, I'm going to go. What are three things you'd recommend? Liver's pretty important. I mean, if you can do liver, get liver. It's, it's a little hard to get a grocery store sometimes. Get a good quality grass-fed red meat. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm less a fan of chicken and pork because the quality of the feed of the chicken and pork is not as good as the grass that grass-fed cows are eating. So start with a grass-fed red meat and get whatever cut you like. Get ground beef if you want something cheaper or get it. I like a skirt steak. It's tender or a ribeye or a tenderloin, whatever. Now, I have to confirm this by looking at the actual composition of these. A tenderloin, my suspicion is that a tenderloin has less collagen than like a skirt steak mm. because it's like less fibrous. It's just like mostly muscle meat. There's still going to be some in there, but there are some cuts that are going to be more collagenous. So get some red meat. If you really, I think ideally get some liver. Okay. Get it frozen, get it fresh, or get desiccated organs in your diet. And then the third thing I would say would probably either tallow, which you can put on your face, mm -hmm. or um, or something like a raw cheese or raw dairy. And, and start with those things. And then for your carbohydrates, we can talk about those, but you want to think like fruit and fruit juice and good, good honey, but that's down the road. Our listeners want more information, where can they find you? What should they read? You know, you name it. Um, the, sorry, my website is carnivoremd.com. If you look for Carnivore MD or my name, which is Paul Saladino MD on any of the social media platforms, you'll find it. If you want to try some of the desiccated organs because you're not ready for them, you can find Heart and Soil at heartandsoil.co.co. Love that. The skin, hair, and nails would probably be the best place for your audience to start because it has the trachea and scapula cartilage. But I think any of them with liver would be helpful for people. And then just, you know, stop putting the garbage on your skin. But yeah, I hope people will find it valuable. My podcast is called Fundamental Health. It's available everywhere. But the, the key is just like, be curious, you know, think for yourself. I hope this makes you feel curious. And it's so much fun to get to offer ideas that are different than what people have heard before, because a lot of people will just be very, 
I don't know, like they're, they're taken aback by it, but most people hopefully can find some curiosity and do their own thinking. And the proof is in the pudding. I mean, it's incredible what happens when people make these changes. Thank you.